The sky darkens, the air chills, birds fall silent, and for a few minutes in the middle of the day, the sun simply vanishes. That's a total solar eclipse, one of the most breathtaking sights on Earth. No wonder our ancestors thought it was a terrible omen, the very source of life suddenly swallowed by shadow. To them, it meant disaster. To us today, though, to see one is an outrageous stroke of luck, not just because total eclipses are rare, but because they are total at all. You see, the sun is about 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's also about 400 times farther away. The two line up almost perfectly in our sky, creating eclipses so exact, so dramatic, they look like they were staged just for us. But it made me wonder, how do eclipses on other planets look like? Are they any better than ours? Maybe they happen more often or look weirder. And what if we try to deliberately engineer some? Buckle up for I'm going to show you what no other YouTube channel ever did. Let's begin with terrestrial planets. Mercury is the closest to the sun, scorching by day, freezing by night. But in the eclipse department, nothing. No moon means no lineup. Beneath those crushing clouds and hurricane winds, Venus is moonless too. Maybe it did have a satellite in the distant past, but it rammed into the planet, making it spin very slow. But what about our moon? Well, technically it has a partner, us. A solar eclipse there is Earth blocking the sun. The sky is already black, so there's no sudden twilight. Stars don't come out. They never left. What you see instead is Earth hanging huge and dark, its rim glowing deep red as sunlight filters through our atmosphere and bends around the edge like a worldwide ring of sunsets poured into space. And the show is slow. Because Earth is so much larger than the sun appears from the moon, these eclipses can last for hours, plunging the surface into long stretches of cold shadow. How often do they happen? From Earth, we see about two to three lunar eclipses per year, sometimes up to five. To clarify, each one of those is also a solar eclipse as seen from the moon's near side. Only this hemisphere ever gets to see eclipses, while the far side of our satellite never experiences them at all. And just recently, on March 14th, 2025, we finally saw a lunar eclipse from the surface of the moon for real. NASA's commercial lander Blue Ghost, built by Firefly Aerospace, captured a total solar eclipse as Earth passed directly in front of the sun. This red glare makes it so eerie. But we also have a literal red planet. Unlike Mercury and Venus, Mars does have moons, two of them. Phobos, the closer one, is a lumpy rock only about 20 kilometers across, but it hugs Mars so tightly that it can cover up to a third of the sun. The effect is eerie, uneven, jagged shapes sliding across the solar disk. And because Phobos orbits once less than in eight hours, these eclipses streak by in less than a minute. But they happen often. In fact, they come in seasons a couple of times each Martian year. And rovers, like Curiosity and Perseverance, have filmed them many times. One recent shot from Perseverance went viral, Phobos crossing the sun created a lopsided, comic-looking, googly eye in the sky, with the jagged little moon acting like a moving pupil. At the same time, Deimos, the farther moon, barely leaves a mark. It's too small, too distant. When it crosses, it looks like nothing more than a tiny speck gliding across the sun for a few seconds before drifting away. Blink and you'd miss it. But what about gas giants? Jupiter is where eclipses stop being rare and start becoming routine. With over 90 known moons, including two giants larger than our own, alignments are happening constantly. From space, it's spectacular. 
You can actually watch two or three moons cast shadows on Jupiter at the same time, dark spots racing across those striped clouds. Astronomers on Earth love these events because they happen so often and are easy to predict. But what if you were floating inside Jupiter's atmosphere? Most of the time, the experience feels less like an eclipse and more like an early sunset. When Io, Europa, or Ganymede crosses the sun, they don't leave a ring of light the way our moon does. They blot the sun out entirely, plunging regions of Jupiter into a few minutes of full night. But Callisto is a special case. Because it's farther away, its apparent size is closer to the sun's. That means its eclipses can look more familiar. An inky disk with the corona still glowing around it, and even a faint band of sunrise circling the horizon. The event is short, only a few minutes, but unlike on Earth, it repeats every couple of weeks. Saturn, by contrast, is all about variety. Its moons are numerous and oddly shaped. The biggest one, Titan, is so huge compared to the Sun, it's not even fair and looks just like nighttime. But when some of the smaller ones pass across the Sun, say, potato-like Hyperion and Calypso, their silhouettes are uneven, creating eclipses that look misshapen and alien. The best ones you can get are from Prometheus and Janus that cover the disk of the Sun, leaving the corona mostly intact, like on Earth. Then there are the rings. From Saturn itself, the rings cast colossal shadows that sweep across its clouds like planet-sized sundials. Instead of waiting for one dramatic blackout, you live in a shifting play of shadows and light bands that change as Saturn turns, push outward to the last planets, and the Sun itself becomes the limiting factor. By Uranus's distance, the Sun is only a fraction of its familiar size, and by Neptune's, it's barely more than a point of light. Most eclipses here simply erase that tiny disk entirely. No corona, no glowing twilight, just a clean blackout. But there are exceptions. On Uranus, the small moon Perdita lines up almost perfectly with the sun. Its eclipses can restore some of the drama. The corona faintly visible, a thin sunrise glow wrapping the horizon, though all on a diminished scale. Neptune has one too. Its moon hippocamp is just the right size to cover the sun without hiding its atmosphere completely. Here again, you'd see a fragile ring of light, the closest thing to Earth-style eclipses this far out. So, after touring the whole solar system, Earth is still the jackpot winner. Nowhere else do you get eclipses with the same mix of drama and delicacy. The corona shining, the sky turning to twilight, stars appearing in the middle of the day. Still, any single spot on Earth might see a total eclipse only once every few centuries. But what if we tried to make them even cooler? Imagine every other planet in the solar system resized or relocated until it also covers that same half degree in our sky as the moon. At first glance, it sounds like we'd just be trading one eclipse for another. But the truth is, this bends the solar system producing alignments and side effects that go far beyond what you could expect. Mercury is slightly larger than the Moon, so it's the perfect first candidate for eclipse transplant. It would have a wider orbit, but the catch is Mercury contains a lot of heavy metals, so its mass is four times larger due to superior density. So it would pull much stronger tides across our oceans, giving coastlines a daily reminder of the change. And because it circles more slowly, eclipses would linger a little longer. Instead of today's maximum seven minutes of darkness, you could get totalities lasting eight or even nine nine minutes. Those mercurial eclipses would still come a few times each year, about as often as they do now. Sounds like a more epic version of current eclipses and still quite comfortable for us. Now, picture Mars in that sweet spot. 
To scale it to the moon's apparent size, you'd need place it farther from Earth at approximately 749,000 kilometers. That's twice the moon's orbit. This distance is still well inside Earth's hill sphere, the 1.5 million kilometer zone where Earth's gravity dominates over the sun's and can hold a satellite. Mars would circle Earth in about 71 days, so the rhythm of months would slow down. Tides would rise stronger than today, pulled by Mars's greater mass, and Earth itself would wobble more around the shared center of gravity. Eclipses would be the prize, because Mars moves more slowly across the Sun from that distance. Totality would stretch longer than anything the Moon can give us. You could see up to 15 minutes of night at midday. So, Mars would double the length of the show. The view would be unforgettable. A reddish disk with faint dark markings drifting across the solar face. Those cool eclipses would be twice as rare, though. Moreover, the whole Earth-Mars system itself would be fragile, since in the outer half of Hill's sphere, or Orbits are less stable over long timescales, so we could have those Mars totalities for millions of years at best. Eventually, Earth's and the Sun's competing tug would slowly nudge Mars out of place. Eventually, Mars might spiral outward and drift free into its own orbit. So then you could probably guess that Venus, as our partner planet, would be even more problematic. To look the same size in our sky, it would orbit much farther out, more than a million and three hundred thousand kilometers away. That means it would circle the Earth only twice a year, moving slowly enough that its eclipses would be extraordinary marathons. Instead of a fleeting seven minutes of darkness, the Sun could vanish behind Venus for half an hour at a time. It would happen only once in two or three years, though. But there's an unexpected side effect that would remind us of Venus every night. This planet already outshines everything else in the night sky, and up close, it would blaze six times brighter than a full moon. Its thick cloud cover would reflect sunlight with dazzling efficiency, turning nights into something closer to twilight. But might I remind you, Venus is almost Earth's twin in size and mass, and on the edge of Hill's sphere, it's a recipe for disaster. Gravity would turn the system into a constant tug of war. The sun's pull would complicate it further, pulling on Venus until its orbit unraveled. At worst, it could destabilize Earth's own orbit, leading to trajectories that eject our planet from the inner solar system entirely. In mere thousands of years, we all could freeze to death because we wanted cooler and longer eclipses. You think I'd stop at that? Not a chance! Time for gas giant eclipses, and the main thing about them, they are far too massive to ever orbit Earth. Our planet being their satellite is also off the table, since to appear the same size as the moon in our sky, gas giants have to sit millions of kilometers away, well beyond their own hill spheres that close to the sun. There's still a way, actually, but let's focus on the show for now. Neptune and Uranus are nearly twins, so the geometry works out almost the same. Each would need to hover from about five to five and a half million kilometers from Earth to look moon-sized in the sky. Picture the sun disappearing behind a vast indigo disk for Neptune or a tilted teal globe for Uranus. These eclipses would last longer than anything the moon gives us now. They're great disks drifting slowly across the solar face up to an hour, haunting and truly epic. But Saturn is even cooler. To appear the same size as our moon, it would need to be about 13 million kilometers away. Imagine the sun vanishing behind Saturn's golden bulk, its razor-thin rings cutting a curtain across the sky. Striped shadows would make it seem as if the sun had been shattered into bars of light and dark. This up to two hour long show would be theatrical, breathtaking, and truly one of a kind. 
You see, to pull this off, we'd need to place a gas giant in an orbit around the Sun, but tens of times closer to Earth than Mars and Venus. And even if we just delete those planets in favor of, let's say, Saturn, it wouldn't help much. The gravity of a giant world at that distance would start pulling Earth off its orbit almost immediately. And since the total eclipse alignment will happen only once in decades, well, it means it will happen only once, period. Earth won't keep its orbit after the event, and it means no more exact totalities. It's virtually impossible to predict what comes next, but one thing is clear. In the next hundred years, close gas giant approaches will bring us total gravitational chaos. Dragged by them, Earth would likely end up much closer to the Sun, like Venus. And that means we'll just burn to death. But man, the Jupiter eclipse scenario is on the whole other level. To shrink it to half a degree in the sky, it would need to sit about 15 and a half million kilometers from Earth. The eclipse itself would be overwhelming. The sun swallowed by Jupiter's banded globe, the great red spot drifting across the solar face like a storm the size of Earth itself. For up to three hours, it would be the most spectacular eclipse ever seen by human eyes. But then the catastrophe begins. Jupiter's mass is more than 300 times that of Earth. At this distance, its pull would dominate our orbit, twisting us out of step with the Sun. Even if Jupiter doesn't slingshot Earth somewhere at once, its orbit would elongate. Winters could drag on for years, summers collapse into weeks, climate as we know it would disintegrate. Oh, and by the way, if we still kept the Moon in this scenario, Jupiter would tear it from us. Pulled into unstable paths, it could spiral away into space or be swallowed by Jupiter. And beyond gravity comes something you wouldn't normally consider, radiation. At the closest approach, Earth would slip inside Jupiter's magnetosphere, the largest in the solar system, stretching tens of millions of kilometers. Our planet would be flooded with charged particles. Auroras would rage across every latitude, a constant global light show. But that beauty would be lethal. The bombardment would strip our atmosphere, sterilize the surface, and leave Earth a glowing husk. And after all that destruction, in a couple of thousand years, we could even end up as just another satellite of Jupiter, now staging cool eclipses for our new master, with no one surviving long enough to see them. But wait, what if we go beyond the solar system? This is Kepler 11 system, about 2000 light years away. It's a sun-like star with six planets packed tightly around it all larger than Earth, super-Earths and mini-Neptunes ranging from almost twice Earth's size to more than four times. They crowd so close that the inner five all orbit nearer than Mercury does to our Sun. From the surface of one of these worlds, the sky would be a constant eclipse theater. Neighboring planets would loom as enormous disks, sometimes big enough to blot the significant portion of the star. You could even see double or triple eclipses. And because these orbits are so tight and so fast, you wouldn't have to wait centuries for such a spectacle. Eclipses could sweep across the sky every few days or weeks. This is exactly how the Kepler Space Telescope spotted them from afar. Tiny dips of light, shadows of super-Earths slipping across their star, and up close, these eclipses would be overwhelming, more so due to their frequency. Would you travel over 2,000 light years for the show, if given the opportunity? Or do you consider even those special flights chasing eclipses on Earth cheeky? Drop your thoughts in the comments.